Do you want water, John? Yeah, thanks. As you can see, I'm not doing any cycling. So today we're joined by Sir Bradley Wiggins, who is, uh, until 2021, the most highly decorated Olympian, um, master cyclist, and first British winner of the Tour de France. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, your cycling career and move on to you know, what you're doing currently, um, if that's all, all yeah. good. To start at the beginning, um, so your father was a professional cyclist. He was. Yeah. yeah. And would you say that's an influence on how you developed uh, an interest in cycling? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, my, my dad was um, an Australian. He came over in the 1970s. Um, he was a pretty tough guy outback Australian, and he was really good at cycling, he had a huge talent, and could have been a lot better than he was, but he basically drank himself to death, and um, he was uh, quite a loose character, um, quite a violent man, and, um, but he had a big talent, you know, a big engine, and he could have gone very far in the sport. He was, um, you know, he became a, a world champion himself, and, um, you know, kind of then sort of got carried away with the success really and the money and things and uh, left myself when I was a young baby. I never saw him again until I was 19. So I, I, I kind of didn't see him for 17 years, 18 years. Um, I don't quite know how long actually because my mum never told me. Um, but it's... Uh, so he kind of... I, I kind of grew up um, in the knowledge about him because my mother informed me a lot about him and um, glorified all his bad traits and glorified him in cycling sense as well. Um, and... I um, grew up idolising him, and he was my hero, um, and I always wanted to emulate him and things like that. So obviously, I got very good about 16 years old, 17, um, and he was, um, yeah, it was it was interesting. Really. I think I realise now when I look back that that was the drive really throughout my kind of teenage years. Really, was to, to emulate the success in in his um, in his absence really. So um, that's kind of how I got into cycling really. My mum, I was playing football a lot when I was a teenager, and my mum kind of pushed me into cycling, really. Um, and I didn't really want to do it at first, but she... It was her way of kind of showing my dad that she, what she'd do with their son, you know? So I kind of got caught in this kind of... Um, kind of the crossfire of their kind of fallout. And she developed a monster in terms of me, really, mm. in a cycling sense, which I don't think she ever anticipated. You said, um, said before that you hate cycling now, but... Yeah, I mean, I don't enjoy yeah. riding my bike. It's fucking hard yeah. work, you know? <laughs> I, I never really did enjoy it. I, I thought I loved it at one point, and people sort of say to me now, it's a shame you've fallen out of love with cycling. I didn't really enjoy it when I look back now. I've kind of come to the, that conclusion. I, I, I don't ride my bike for a reason, because I don't like it. Um, it's just you have to ride it for such a long time. I mean, have you ever been up a hill on a bike? It's hard work. Not hills like you. Yeah. Um, but I did become obsessed with cycling as a child. Yeah. In, in terms of, like, you know, once I kind of... And that, that all stemmed, again, from this kind of being a, a, my dad in, in the absence of my father, really. It was like I threw myself and thrust myself into cycling, really, and became obsessive, in a, a, like I do with most things, in a, in a kind of weird way for a teenager, really, growing up in central London on a council state in the early 90s. This was before Rafa and how cycling became cool, you know? Um, and I, um, it was a challenging time, really, for me, but I... Uh, I think it, it was it, a lot of cycling for me was just it was to get the sense of freedom that it gave me in terms of running away from 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 my environment I was growing up in and stuff like that. It's quite a rough environment, and um, yeah, I think that, that's kind of why I did it really. I've only just really it took me forty years to realise that really. Um, yeah, do you have like a sort of image of being on the podium that motivated you through something that you didn't enjoy, or you know what got you up? Not not just the podium. No, I mean it was always about winning for me. Um, and I, 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 I never saw it any other way than other than being successful, really. It's weird. I kind of, um, from the age of 12, I watched Chris Borden win the Olympic Games in, in Barcelona on the Lotus bike, um, and I was obsessed with the Tour de France, and I remember telling my art teacher, Miss Kennett, she was a right bitch, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was 12. I was pissing around in art, and she said to me... Um, Come on, you, you know, what are you going to do with the rest of your life, Bradley? And I said, I want to win the... I said, listen, love. I didn't say listen, love, but it sounds good now. I said, uh, I, want to, um, I want to wear the yellow jersey into the France, win the Olympic Games. And she laughed at me. and Because uh, we wasn't saturated at that time with Olympic champions and, and things like that. Mm. It, it wasn't... It, now it's much more 
you know, viable that p kids can do that, you know, because we've got so many great champions in this country. But, um, yeah, she, she said that to me, laughed. And, and that was kind of, you weren't, kids weren't encouraged to be very ambitious in West London then, you know, in state school. It was very, um, you know, you, you, your sort of future was destined for whatever it was, you know, whether it was working in Ladbrokes or being a part, you know, milkman or postman. That was, there wasn't much to aspire to be, or being on the dole, you know. When kids are going on at 16, 17 to sign on at the dole with their dads, you know, there's not much, much there's not much to hope, really. So, um, yeah, it was, it was like that, really. Um, but I was always very ambitious, and that came from... Um, my mum, really, I suppose, and my grandparents, really, that it was quite an emotionless family, really, but, you know, it was... Achievement was put up amongst any, everything else as, as what was success in life, really. Um, so that was kind of like, you know, you had to win, really. It was, otherwise, you'd be bloody useless, as my granddad used to say. You know, and I think that was kind of where that came from, the pressure to win, really, yeah. you know, as, as a mark of um, what success in life was. Um, I remember I asked you before, you know, do you regret uh, being the cycling champion that you were and having this career? Um, mm. you know, did it give you fulfillment or happiness when you got to the point that you'd been thinking about the whole time? No, no, it didn't. It was, it was very emotionless and it was like a box ticking exercise a lot of the time. And it never felt like I thought it was supposed to feel. I didn't know what it was supposed to feel like, but you have this sort of image of what it's supposed to feel like or this kind of romantic vision of what it's going to be like, but it was never like that. And um, winning became the standard from very early on, and that was the marker, really. So it was, um, it was, um, there was no second place after that from the first Olympic. Well, my second Olympic Games in Athens, I won gold. And from that on, the next four Olympics, it was always about winning. And so when it becomes like that, it becomes an emotionless experience where it's a relief when you've won more than anything that you've got the gold and you've kept the standard. Mm. Um, but it, it takes... But then I guess, I guess there is a contradiction in that that is, sport isn't supposed to be enjoyable, you know, at that success. Um, you know, people that get a bronze medal and things like that, they're overjoyed that they've won a bronze medal. But you, um, you can only lose an Olympic final. There's only first or second place, so it's, um, it's heartache for one person, but relief for the other, I think, more than anything. It's particularly when you're having repeated success. Um, and the more success you have, you know, the, the more pressure that comes with it every time you put yourself on the line. So, yeah, towards the end of my career, it was, it was I mean, by Rio, by the Olympics in Rio, it was just, let's get me out of here, let's win this thing and go home. And yeah. I craved normality by that point. So it wasn't, it wasn't an enjoyable experience from that point of view, no. But by then, your, 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 your whole life is just about application and going through a process and a routine, a daily routine, and it's a job by that point. Um, and you, you could go on for another four years and try and do another Olympic Games, but it's just the pressure that comes with that. Well, what if you don't win in four years' time? That's, that's the question, really, because, as I say, winning became the standard. So it's then about trying to find something else to do in your life where you can have, you know, the passion enough to put the same application in and hard work to, to have an end result and whatever. And I haven't really found that yet. You told me you were getting into boxing. Has that become...? Well, so, yeah, before that, I, I, when I retired, the, the yeah. first thing, you know, uh, I... I'm, I'm quite encyclopedic about cycling. I've got extensive knowledge of it from my obsession when I was a child. Um, and it's the only thing I ever learned when I was a kid. I was like a sponge to, to all this sort of stuff, you know, and um, that carried me well through a couple of years of broadcasting and doing the Tour de France and things like that. But after last year, I kind of had enough of that as well. It's not fulfilling enough. And I um, now I'm kind of in limbo a little bit and I've started doing other things. I've been working with the NSPCC and Mind Charity and doing stuff that's, you know, kind of much more rewarding, really, um, fulfilling, yeah. anyway. And t talking about my story, not in terms of a sob story, but more in the, with the view of helping other people. Um, and to do that, you have to be quite honest, and I had to go to some dark places in order to do that. But um, I have took up boxing since January um, out of the blue um, because I've found that it's put me really out of my comfort zone and yeah. it's reminded me of what cycling... I don't know what I say. It's reminded me what cycling was like in terms of a daily routine... Um, but cycling, this has been very hard to do and trying to challenge and master. Although I did take up rowing when I stopped cycling a bit to try and do the same thing there. I love the sort of routine of things like that and um, learning a new skill that's quite difficult to learn. Mm. Um, but cycling was never like that for me. Cycling came easy to me when I was a child. And I think most things do when you're, when you're a child anyway. They, they're certainly easier than trying to take them on when you're, when you're an adult. So you're filming um, 
a documentary about imposter syndrome with the BBC yeah. today. I just wanted to ask about that because um, some of your coaches have characterised you as a cyclist as being very self-critical. Um, mm. Do you think you were too harsh on yourself during your career? And what yeah, did you do differently? I'm quite harsh on myself in general, even yeah. in daily life. You know, I'm quite a self-aware person, and you have to be critical of yourself in order to move forward and be a better person or a better version of yourself. But yeah, I was highly critical of myself, and I, mean, I don't think I, that's a bad thing. That's probably why I was so good at what I did as well, yeah. because. Um, I think if you can delude yourself very easily, particularly with cycling or any sport, really, that, you know, what worked last year will work again, really. And I think in terms of moving forward, you always have to move the boundaries and stretch the goalposts a little bit in terms of um, getting a better performance, really. You think it's like that for every champion? Yeah, I think so. I think it has to be. But also for every champion. I think there's, there's another sort of part to that as well, is that we're we talking about being someone who's great at something. Mm. And I mean greatness in terms of the causes like a societal change, you know, and, or being good at something, really. There's, there's a difference between great at something and being good at something. Mm. And I think a lot of greatness comes from a past in your life, really, a sort of a pain, like an adversity, really, yeah. that drives you. That's almost a distraction from facing that, really. And I think I've spoke to a lot of people over the years now, and I think that's become true of most people that are, are good at something, is that there's, a, there's something that's different about them to the people that are just good at something. Um, and it's a really interesting, fascinating thing to explore because um, it's a lot of the times it comes with like a heartache and things like that, that they're running away from a, a trauma or things like that that they haven't addressed. And it's perhaps why they've had such an extended successful career as well is because the longer you extend it and the longer your career you have, you don't have to address it. You said that uh, just before that um, cycling was a sort of, gave you freedom from... Yeah your past, um, is that why you preferred the road to the track? No, I mean, I didn't know it gave me freedom. I just yeah. realised that in the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to go into a question more about the cycling, what is the, you know, why did you end up doing Tour de France instead of... Uh, I got, yeah, I think I just, I'd done three Olympic Games on the track by then, mm. and um, I wasn't earning any money, and I had two kids by then, so I thought I'd better go and start doing something that paid the mortgage. Um, and it was a good time filler between the next Olympic Games, and, and so I went and did um, went to a team called Garmin at the time, yeah. with a view to riding for someone else called a guy called Christian Vanderveld, who'd finished fourth in the Tour de France in 2008. And um, I'd won three Olympic golds by then, and London was on the horizon four years later. Um, but I thought, you know, late twenties now, it'd be nice to go and do the Tour de France and, and really commit to it and be part of a successful team riding yeah. in the in the service of someone else. And I did that, and I ended up surpassing the team leader and getting him fourth and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lance Armstrong for the podium that year, which opened up a whole new avenue for potentially what I could do the next few years in terms of, you know, I've got a new job here, a new job prospect, mm. Mm. and it's not just on the track. Um, so I never ended up never going back to the track for London 2012. I went and did the road events. So it kind of was a nice time filler for the next six years, really, of something yeah. to do. And Although I never enjoyed that. It was, that was a, you know, even harder... Um, I, I had to learn a new kind of way of living as a cyclist, really, and it, it was a lot more. Yeah. I had to adopt a sort of monk persona, really, and it was like a, it was, became a religion at that point. It was a 24-hour job, yeah. uh, seven days a week, and everyone around you had to live that. And I became a dreadful person doing it. You know, it's a very, um, it's a very uh, selfish way of living, and um, people have to live it with you, and it's tough, you know, when you've got two kids... Um, and I think that's what kept me kind of sane a little bit as well and, and realised that there is a world outside of this when you stop and you don't have to go and win 10 Tour de France's now. One will do, because your kids need you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking about the money aspect of track versus yeah. road. Um, so in 2009, you were made a millionaire almost overnight. When you time, well, according to the BBC interview. Oh, fuck the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> they can talk. Yeah. Um, but so you time, uh, signed with Team Sky. Mm. Uh, in 2009, then the Tour de France yeah. was not what it was expected. Um, how did you get through that period? I mean, it was really hard. I mean, we had to sort of thought we knew it all and kind of had to go back to the drawing board, really. Um, plus, I wasn't a team leader, mm. you know, and I had to step up to the plate. I, the, I had the benefit the year before at Garmin of being one of the helpers who was kind of came out of nowhere. But once I was thrust into the limelight as a team leader in front of 25 riders, I didn't know. I couldn't. I'm not really a leader. I'm quite a, a sort of introvert, more of a bass player, sit at the back of the stage, you know? Yeah. Um, 
I'm not a front man and I don't like the kind of, when I had to become that front man, I kind of adopted a rock star persona and, you know, yeah. it was quite kind of entertaining and because I could, that's the way I handled it really. I handled it by being either quite contentious and shocking when I wasn't doing very well or funny as fuck and drunk when I was doing well. And that's kind of how I got through those years. But that built a perception of me that was perhaps a little bit fake, really. And I kind of hid under that veil. I found it far easier to go in public, playing, you know, with the long hair and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it was that was all sort of uh, more of a like a, a sort of insecurity, not knowing who I was. I'd been a professional cyclist pretty much since I was thirteen. Um, I was quite an insecure kid. I'd. Um, that had stemmed from many things. I was sexually abused by my first coach in my teens. Um, I'd, my father had abandoned me, so I didn't have a father figure around when that was happening. And all those things kind of built, you know, a kind of, um, yeah, just lots of traumas that kind of I, I, I was, and cycling was an escapism from that childhood, really, and became a distraction for the next 30 years. Yeah. And it's when I stopped at 36, I had to deal with all this stuff. It was like thrust upon me like a skip of rubbish. Mm. You know, but it's yeah, you know, I'm far better place now for it. Was that pain what put you, enabled you to get through? I didn't know it was pain. You don't know it is when you're a kid. You know, you yeah. just these things, then you thrust them and you bury bury things. You think oh, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but then my when I I met my father for the first time I was 19, and that was really and my son's 18 in a couple of weeks' time, mm. and I see it through the eyes of him now. If he had to meet me when he was 18, 19 years of age, yeah. Uh, it's a very difficult thing for, to do as a man, particularly when you're, you're quite demasculated at that point anyway. My stepfather was quite violent towards me in my teens, like most kids' dads were when they were in the late 80s and early 90s. This was before the new age man, you know. Um, this is where you're allowed to hit people. Um, and it was um, all those things. Plus, I grew up in a council state, which was a really violent place, you know. I mean, so at the school I went to, I witnessed a murder. My head teacher got stabbed, Philip Lawrence, in 1995. I don't remember, got stabbed by the Somalian triad on the outside the school when I was there and I remember watching that and thinking this guy got punched it looked like he'd been punched and I didn't realize till six o'clock news that night he'd been he'd been stabbed because you know if someone gets stabbed I don't know if any of you have seen anyone get stabbed um but it's it's quite a it just it, it's it's a very surreal thing you know you don't realize it's happened um and um I didn't realize that that was I was so normalized to violence in where I grew up as a way of living that 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 you accept a lot of things that happen to you as normal and that it's okay, you know. Because, but you real, I realise now that it's such an abnormal way and such a, a, a horrific way to grow up like that, really. But again, all those things was it, it, why cycling became such a... It facilitated me escaping from all that environment and that past, you know. But I, 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 you can never let it go and you carry it with you for that period, really. So, as I say, it's only when I got... My kids got to the age they're at now and my son is a cyclist now. He took it up when he was 13, the same age as I pretty much did. So I've, I've watched him develop over the last five years. And it's been like watching myself in the mirror, really. He's very, very talented, probably better than I was. Um, and he, um, he is uh, on the fringes of the Olympic squad next year for the track. Um, and it's, um, it's funny, isn't it? How, you know, I've, again, I'm no different to many other people, and this isn't a sob story. It's just um, I, I realise it's why I was so good at cycling really was because of you know my, my my childhood really and without that i would never have had the drive to do what i did yeah it's it's a real contradiction and um but it's what you do with it now and i've addressed it all and i like i said i i'm much more get much more fulfillment out of working for things like the nspcc and launching campaigns and child abuse and things like that and 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 you know my biggest sort of shame and trauma was became the, the sort of bravest thing i ever did really when coming out about it yeah. Um, with the view of helping others and accepting that it was not normal. So, um, and then I met my dad, as I said, when I was 19 and I wished he was there and that was kind of one of the biggest sort of traumas of my life, really. I realise now as, you know, as a man meeting your dad when you're 19. Then he got murdered when I was 28, just before the Olympic Games. And I had to make a decision whether I went to the funeral or not and things like that. And so, just, just you know, the, the kind of, you're a product of your environment and you're a product of your childhood and your parents, unfortunately, you can't choose them. But... Um, it's, um, it's, it's kind of what you do with it in latter, latter years, really. And you can live with this stuff forever or you can, you can, you can address it and um, use it for, for, to change for the better, you know, for other people as well, because lots of people go through this. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a humbling thing to go through. 
and the, one of the reasons why you don't address these things and go through them is a lot of the time is because you're an Olympic champion. You're a five times Olympic champion, winning the Tour de France. You must be so mentally strong. Am I fuck? <laughs> you know, we're all just the same underneath it all, really. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Thanks. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, I think we'll do some audience questions briefly, yeah. and I'll come back with some at the front here. Yeah, that's fine. So my first one is um, about COVID, unfortunately. And when you first came into the Peloton, it was before Operation Fat 7, before the sort of beginning of Lung Armstrong, um, and uh, the widespread um, to stab up down the body, um, how it was going to come out. How aware were you um, of the sort of extent of COVID in the Peloton? How much of that was COVID or not? Well, I think we were all aware of it. Even the journalists were, the press were. That was the hypocrisy in the whole thing. My dad was a professional cyclist. He used to sell drugs to people, you know? So I was well aware of it. Um, but it was one of those things. It was just acceptant, you know? It was... Um, and you had to make a decision. I came into the peloton in 2002 when it started kicking off around the Frank Vandenbroek stuff, really. And I was sat in um, the back of a camping car. My first year as a professional one, and one of the doctors came in and said to us, right... Um, I'm going to be looking after you for the next few years and all your preparation. I used to call it preparation. And he said, um, um, but we're going to go easy to begin with, you know. Um, and the week after that, it all kicked off in this, and the French team that I was in decided that we were going to abolish all this kind of preparation behind the scenes, really. So it, the timing for me was, was perfect in the sense that um, we became the cleanest team in the peloton at that point. Now, this was La France de Jour. Um, but I can't sit here now and say that had it still been as institutionalised and as systemic as it was then now, that I, at 22, you know, kind of as a professional cyclist, that you wouldn't naturally just fall into those things, you know? I don't know. A lot of these ex-professionals that sort of sit here now and say, you know, I decided to leave the sport because I, I didn't want to dope, I think it's horseshit, you know? I think it's because they weren't good enough to begin with anyway. And I think, you know, you've got journalists like Paul Kimmage and that that sit there spouting about these things. Let's not forget, he doped and he was still shit. You know, and so there's, this is the hypocrisy around the whole thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a minefield, and it really is. And it's still an open wound and will remain an open wound for a long time within the sport, you know, which is thrust upon the shoulders of one man, of course, Lance Armstrong. But um, I like Lance. I get on with him very well. He's a good father to his five children. He's a good husband to his wife, Anna. And um, it's a bit disproportionate to what some people get away with in life, really. And I think it's, there's a, lot, a huge loss of perspective when we talk about this subject, particularly in cycling. And it's, it, you, we're never going to get a, very far with it in terms of finding a solution when we don't take the whole kind of picture into account, really. And it's, um, a lot of that is, you know, unfortunately down to the way the press report it and stuff like that. You know, they love a good story, as we know, and it's, um, there's very few facts that are around when dealing with these subjects. And there's a lot of lack of money as well within these organisations that need the, the ones faced with dealing with these problems because they're frightened of getting sued and they don't have the money... To, to protect themselves, you know, particularly UCADs and things like that. So it's very, very difficult. And we've just seen a problem now in boxing with Conor Ben, who said, you know, problem, then there's been no outcome, and he seems like he's back to box now. So there's a lot of... Um, lots of st other sports aren't faced with the same sort of scrutiny as cycling, really. So it's... Um, but one thing I will say now is that um, you can... I can 100% say that the, the guys that are winning the Tour de France now, the Pogacars of this world and that, you probably probably some of the cleanest athletes in um, any sport now. So we've come a long, long way in cycling. And then my second question is, I went to watch you at the uh, six days again, in 2016, when you worked with Cap. Yeah. And um, one thing that really struck me was, I think it was on the points rates, was compared to every other the cyclist, you always seem to be able to get the right positioning three, four laps out like yeah. finish. And I guess, how were you able to sort of fight your way for the position? But then, in that case, how were you able to put yourself in a situation where you consistently in the right position? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I just, I mastered the track and it came easy to me because I was so obsessive with it when I was a kid. I, I intricate detail in my head of every track and every bend and particularly Ghent. It's my earliest memories as a child of being in the track centre again when my dad was racing. So, um, that track came easy to me, really, and it's such a small track as well that you have to think four or five laps in ahead in advance. And the only way I can describe it is kind of like when I was watching a lot of rugby league when I lived up in Wigan, I'd sit there with ex-players, you know, like Sean, um, Sean Edwards and that, that would watch it, and they'd see the game five or six plays ahead. And it was very much similar like that, really. 
seeing something, you know, ahead of, of how it's going to pan out. A bit like when you're driving down the road and you see someone's going to step off the pavement up ahead. And that, it's, it's that having that peripheral perspective and that seeing the race ahead and be able to read it and not just happening in the moment is kind of what I could do with a track, really, which was um, useless to me now, because I can't, unless I'm commentating on it. But, um, and, and it's hard to be a coach and try and coach and instill that in someone, how to look at that far ahead. I think it has to have it come naturally to you, I think. Uh, that's, that's what I believe. Mm. Um, can I follow on from that? Go for it. Uh, quickly. Um, so you said in one of your past interviews that, uh, you know, winning a Tour de France is not about having good, uh, exceptional, exceptionally yeah. good days or having bad days. It's about having just decently good days every single time. Yeah. I mean, that must have been like a hell of a mental game just to... Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as I said, it was about... Um, I think it was a bit more detailed than that. Yeah. You described it. I think it said you have to be... It's about being 90% good all the time, really, and never having any 100% days or never being below the 90%. It's just consistency, really, and never taking any kind of... Every risk you take is calculated. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's that, really. It's, it is a mind... You know, you train physically for the demands of that race, so you're, you're physically better. You know, the numbers in terms of power to weight put you in the bracket to win the race when you're doing it. The races in the lead-up to that suggest that you're the man to win those races. The mind over three weeks, it's the only race that's long enough that you have to get your hair cut halfway through. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's you know, what were you doing three weeks ago? You hadn't knackered your knee by then, had you? I had. You had? On a bike. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, but that seems like a long time ago, does it? Yes. Yeah, so three, it's, it's, it's trying to get people's heads around just how long three weeks. It's a long time to be doing something day in, day out. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's that really that is, you know, this tough, you know. And I, I led the race from 14 days out. So I had 14 days in yellow. Mm. And um, every day that you're in yellow is, is just, it's like a year, you know, with the things that come around it. It's just, um, and when I won it, I never wanted to go back to it. I thought, that was horrible. I'm not doing that again. It was just, yeah, you know, it, the people that have repetitive set, the likes of Chris Froome and Grant Thomas went back the year after he won and got second, he got third last year. You know, that, that's why they were super seeing me as athletes and bike runners, because I can never do that. And... Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'd take my hat off to anyone that goes back and, and has repetitive success like that. I mean, at least with the Olympics, you've got four years to get your head around it. Mm. But 12 months is uh, it's, it's a tough. Yeah, and it's what makes and defines great sportsmen over others is uh, the ability to step up again and do it again. Mm. So the feeling of victory wasn't worth it for you to make you go through again? I don't know. I wasn't saying it was not worth it. I, I still, to this day, probably find it hard to believe I won the Tour de France that my heroes won. Yeah. And that there's an element of imposter syndrome stepping in there. Yeah. In that, it, it, you know, is this the same yeah. race that I watched Miguel Indurain and Eddie Merckx win? And, yeah. you know, so it says, um, and again, that, that stems from that kind of achievement um, and success from childhood. That's kind of where it stems from, is put uh, above anything else in life, yeah. really. And, uh, yeah, um, yeah. What was going through your head when you won? Do you remember? <laughs> Um, well, I, I led Mark Cavendish out on the last day and that was a way of distracting everyone from looking at me because I, I was quite introvert like that. I didn't like all the attention on me, really, which is why I behaved in such a, a funny way at times when, it, when the cameras were on me, really. And that was, again, that imposter syndrome, really. So, I mean, the, you know, sitting on that throne doing the, the victory sign was a way of, you know, I couldn't in that moment. So I, I, I was more com most confident when I was on the bike. It gave me all my confidence and I could execute Olympic finals in the most you know, confident, um, extreme way. But the minute I stepped off the bike, I had to be me, the person who I didn't know who I was, quite insecure um, and um, quite introvert. So I'd behave in a funny way. So I'd do the V, sat in the Henry VIII throne chair at Hampton Court. There was a, a medal rushed to me in Rio when the, the cameras came on me during the national anthem. I pulled my tongue out. Um, when I won Sports Personality of the Year, I went up and I was kind of drunk and I'm messing around calling Sue Barker Susan. Um, and all those things were like the, the inability to um, act appropriately in, in, in the right way um, on, on huge stages like that. Getting the accolades of that success. Um, because, again, and I knew they came with it, but the minute I stepped off the bike, I had to be Bradley Wiggins and I weren't Sir Wigger anymore. And that, that, I found that very difficult. I think we'll do some more audience at the front here. Uh, you've you, you, you won everything, you've won everything, I guess, but in that period of time, uh, who do you most admire? You said that's a brilliant cyclist, or would you go to some of that? Yeah. Just if you pick one person. Um, 
there's an Italian writer who just retired last year called Vincenzo Nibali, who I loved. He was, um, he, he was the right arsehole when we were racing together. <laughs> I've told him this as well, by the way. So. But he, um, yeah, he was just, when I think back, it was, it was why he was an arsehole was because I was like, couldn't get rid of him at times, you know. I never knew what he was going to do next. And I look back now afterwards, I, th- I, 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 I was so frustrated by him that he got in my head that I thought, that's why I love him. And I went back to the Tour de France for the first time, so I retired in 2016, I went back in 2019 to do the TV. And I asked him for a photo, so I went on the bus and had a photo with him, like a child, you know, and I just, um, it was a pleasure to race with him you know, and share the road with him. Mm. Um. Sure. <laughs> um, so I was, I was wondering, um, what do you think the lasting legacy of this push, particularly during your era of cycling, to focus on marginal gains has been, you know, tracking power meters, tracking carbohydrate yeah. intake, tracking calories. Do you think it's been an overall net good for the sport, or do you think it's kind of taken some of the passion and joy out of cycling? Yeah, it probably, probably has done a lot of that. It's become a very scientific sport now, too, in, in an overkill way, really. Um, but also to the health of the athletes as well. I think it's um, a lot of these guys are 21 now and hovering around three or four percent body fat for most of the year, um, because there's, it's a 12 month season now and there's no off season. You know, cyclists could afford to put weight on in the winter and that now. And I don't think that's a very healthy thing for your body long term, particularly when you get into adulthood. When I retired, I had a DEXA scan and I, uh, my my bones were like 65 year old woman's. You know, I had, um, mild osteoporosis and things like that. And over the last six years, I've had um, done some research for Liverpool University to try and strengthen them, which we have done and stuff. But just, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a non-weight-bearing sport as well. So obviously you're on a bike and it's, it's why there's so many kind of broken bones now when there's crashes and things. But it is a, it is a it's almost become a little bit boring in some ways. Um, and, and the athletes like the race up, like Pogacar and the guy, you know, Vindegaard the last couple of years that have really made it exciting to watch. But Certainly in, in our era with the Sky, Ineos, it was becoming very boring over the next the, a couple of years, you know, kind of the whole Sky training. Um, you have too scientific and all about power and numbers and things like that, but it's, um, it's, it's a funny balance you've got to find between, you know, getting the best out of everyone's bodies from a, um, a uh, scientific way and um, physiological way, but... Um, you have to forget. Well, you kind of, it's easy to forget as a cyclist that you, you know people tune in from around the world to watch this thing, and it's an entertainment to a lot of people. But I don't know the answer to that one. But um, I think a lot of sports getting like that really across the board now. The, the more elite it's got, the you know it's, 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 it's the dropout rates higher, and um, yeah, it's perhaps not as entertaining in some ways as it was when I was a kid. Would you say that was like part of? 2010 for you, I, I remember that um, some of the uh, Team Sky, like, sports analysts and mm. size professionals brought in to yeah. bring an analytical approach to... It did, yeah. Back. Yeah. I mean, we had a guy came in, Tim Kerrison, he, was, he came in from Australian yeah. swimming. Yeah. And he, um, he was really the brains behind us winning in 2012, but he, he kind of had an outside perspective. This is how... Cycling is based around a lot of tradition, and this is how you train, six-hour rides, do this, do this. And he basically turned it upside down and said, well, when we had swimmers, long-distance swimming, he used to train for, uh, trained a lot of long-distance Olympic swimmers. Um, and he basically got us... Um, so, uh, his idea was, if I, could, if I could clear lactate on the climbs when everyone else was developing lactate, that I'd win the Tour de France. So I would train... Rather than just going out and training at threshold, if anyone who understands threshold and kind of, yeah, threshold tolerance for like an hour, um, by the Tour de France in 2012, um, by doing training and going over and under your threshold, so creating lactate in training and then trying to clear it, going back to the same, back to your threshold. So we train over threshold and go back to what your threshold number was. And over time, you could end up clearing lactate of that. But, but, but I do an extensive work like that, really. Um, and, and so, I, you know, in the Tour de France in 2012, when I was riding at 400 watts, I could clear lactate. When other people were riding at 400 watts, were developing lactate. And that, that, that came from swimming, and long-distance swimming, really. So it was... Um, he, he changed the whole, the whole game for us, really. And that training then crept in and, and, and carried on into the Chris Froome era and Grant Thomas. And a lot of the other teams now have caught up with that, really. Um, and I think it was actually... It might have been this university, I can't remember, but particularly in 2012, we were... Ha- I think it was Oxford, actually. 
we were working with I Oxford. Think it was. Huh? I don't think it was Oxford. <laughs> was it here? Can't remember. We were working with them anyway. The whole Olympic team was developing um, synthetic ketones as another fuel source. Mm. And the whole GB cycling used that. And it's now crept into the diet world and things like that. And, but it was trolled in sport um, in terms of whether you could use synthetic ketones as another fuel source, really, um, rather than carbohydrate. Um, so it's, uh, that, again, those are sort of marginal gains where the kind of, you know, the um, cycling was, and sport in general was just getting, like, really, really serious. Yeah. You said you regret this sort of addition, although it's... I don't regret it. I just, it's just an observation, really. I mean, it is, it, is, it is what it is. My son's now benefiting from that, really. But it's, it's very difficult. And the, the, the more I become distanced from the sport and observe it like that, I think it's, like, it, it's almost like a different world to when I was there, really. Yeah. Um, and again, if I was there now, you, 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 you train to the demands of the event and you train to what the tools are there to use it to train to the demands of the event. And I would probably... They probably felt just as extreme then to an older generation when I was doing that. Um, and, and things progress and things move on. They have to, really. And it shows that the traditions in cycling have been broken now and, you know, that it's always moving forward. At the front here. You shared very generously and openly about what you now see drove you and um, your success in your childhood. Um, and you've obviously given um, your children a very different child. So what do you think drives your son now? What do you think, sorry, sorry? What do you think drives your son? Um, yeah, it's a good question, actually. Um, I think uh, uh, there, is a, there is an element with him that, you know, he's, he's got his name on his back with mine, and um, there's obviously the pressure of him then having to, you know, people say to him, well, you, you think you'll be as good as your dad and things like that, and that's where I've been trying to be the biggest support to him. I, I've been trying to be there more for him as a father, really, so I don't get involved with his cycling other than paying interest encourage him and be the one to stick my arm around him, really. But I never wanted to coach him and be the one that was there saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, because I feel that it's still my role and duty as a father to him, first and foremost, but rather than a coach and things like that. So, But he's, um, he's just developing constantly. Every, he surprises me all the time, really. And, I mean, he's not had a, an easy life in some ways, really, because he's, you know, he's, we've had a few sort of health issues in the family with his mother and stuff, and... Um, you know, at times he's been very difficult, but um, he's um, he's just a very good, well-rounded person, which is you know is what was the priority for me. But um, but he's got a drive in him that I didn't have as well. I mean, I did have, but in a different sense. He's, he's got a lot more fight in him. Really, I was very calculated and kind of shy and things like that. And I like things like that's why I like time trialing because it was just if I produce this number to this amount of time, I will win. Whereas I'd sort of duck out of bunch sprints and things like that, but he's he's quite happy to get stuck in and risk crashing, and I hate crashing. Um, so yeah, but I think the drive for him, a lot of it is, um, you know, he was just inspired and and um, by watching myself, you know, and when it, through through his childhood, and he rode up the Champs Elysees with me when he was seven when I won. So I think he, you know, he he he's in love with the sport and he's obsessed with it, but. He did say to me the other day, if he won the lottery, he'd probably give up now. Because I think, it, I think and I, a lot of it is the, the ambition and money as well for him. He's sort of driven by, I think, more that, really. Well, I was driven much more by the purity of the success of something would give me. Um, but like most kids now of his generation, it's all about making money, you know. I mean, he, uh, he went to a grammar, private grammar school, Kirkham Grammar School in the north, and... All his mates now, they've all left school and that, and then some of them are selling, like, snooze pouches and stuff like that. They're, that's kind of... None of them are kind of going to uni and that. They're all kind of stock markets, investing money and this, that, and the other. And it's... Um, I think the drive is, is, is money and the trappings of the success, because cycling now, the, the wages have gone through the roof now as well, and I think that is the biggest drive for a lot of the kids of that age now in cycling, is, is seeing the, the rewards. Yeah. So, yeah, money. Is to answer your question, sadly. Front. Yeah, I think there are. I mean, one of the ones I recognise the most is probably Roger Federer. There doesn't seem anything imposter about him, you know, and uh, I think his uh, 
Tiger Woods, people like that. You know, there are some real sort of robotic, extreme kind of examples that, you know, without talking to them, I don't know, but there are, yeah, the, the ones that are kind of almost like geniuses, you know, that um, are different to the rest of us. So they're, 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 it's, not, it's not a... Uh, it's not true of every, you know, athlete that they've got this kind of... There are the ones that are kind of marked out as geniuses from Dot, you know, t t Lewis Hamilton in Formula One... Um, and they're kind of bred from a young age that that's all they're ever going to do. Um, and they're the ones that I think people can't really resonate with them when they watch them, the success of them. That You know, I think there's a reason that some sportsmen touch the hearts of a nation as well. And I think that is when there's a re they can recognise some sort of vulnerability within them, that they're kind of the person next door, really, and they can... Um, see something of themselves in them and think, well, you know, I could do that one day as well if he could do it, you know. He's from Kilburn, he won the Tour de France, maybe I could. But, but some, of the, some sportsmen in the world that are just, you know, Tom Brady's and things like that, they're just so... They're, just, they're, they're the ones that people can never imagine being like. They're just so good, they're godlike. And um, um, they're far, few and far between, but then there are the kind of, you know, Freddie Flintovs, the Gazers of this world and people like that, that, um, you know, everyone sort of sees a bit of themselves in them. Right back over there. Do you have any regrets from your venture into rowing? Um, not really, no. I mean, you can't win, a, you can't win a, a raffle if you don't buy a ticket, you know? So I thought, you know... And, and again, that was coming out of cycling, really, and, and being institutionalised to have a routine and getting up every day and doing something. And I always loved rowing since I was a kid. And I thought, you know... I was good mates with James Cracknell and I, he, he kind of pushed me into it a bit as well. And, but that was more the view he wanted to get back into rowing. He had this vision of us doing um, maybe Tokyo Olympics in a pair or something, which was never going to happen. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was just, um, I don't know, it was a funny thing. I just kind of, I came out of sight and didn't know what to do with myself and I, I, um, I went to a TV show called The Jump, which was horrendous. Um, and I thought, God, is this my life for the rest of my life now, this... Um, and there was a rowing machine there. We were there for seven weeks, so I jumped on it and I got home from there and I thought, I quite like the idea of, you know, people saying, what do you do with yourself now? Just saying, well, I'm doing a bit of rowing now because it was like a... It was normal to me and it gave me a sense of purpose every day and things like that, but, um, you know, it's like most things, you know, at some point you realise, you know, you know, you, you, it's, it's far-fetched and it's, you know, a bit beyond you and, and you better find something else, you know, so... But no, it was, it was nice. I met some great people doing it and... Um, Got even even more respect for for the guys that do that now, and, and just how athletic they are, and, and you know, it's such a tough sport. Probably hard on cycling in some ways, particularly with the how low the rewards are for it as well compared to cycling. Over there. Just wondering if you had any thoughts on the state of the UK domestic racing system. Because only see today that eighty eighty five, uh, one of the only constants in the UK is the Don Bus. Right. Um, we essentially now have two decent top level teams for domestic Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very difficult. You know, it's, it's all about money now, isn't it? And to run those domestic teams, you know, the budgets have to become higher and higher because of how elite the sport has gone. And, and if you want to have a team now and replicate on a smaller scale something that INEOS do, and have the kind of the science and the marginal gains behind it, you need more money to do that on a smaller scale within a domestic team in the UK. So it's, it's not just... It's become so difficult now. And, and the, the better and the more elite the sport gets at the top end and the more money... I mean, Ineos don't have a budget, so they kind of... It's Jim Radcliffe's way of washing money, really. And um, it's, it's ultimately... So how on earth is, you know, smaller scale teams in the UK going to kind of try to replicate that, that programme... Um, on such a small budget, really, and, and, you know, after COVID and things like that, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult from giving, you know, asking someone for a million quid to do something, you know, with a very little exposure now as well. So it's hard, and I don't know where, where it's going to end up. I, I, I fear the worst, actually, for the domestic scene, yeah, unfortunately. Front here. No, not not cycling. No, no. I try and keep that separate from uh, from.
from um, but but ultimately you know you, you 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 always end up hearing one or two you know that remind you of a time um, but there was more the songs we used to have on the bus before we used to go up and race actually that someone would take control of the stereo and um, yeah but no I never I never really listened to music when I was cycling um, anything I did have when I was warming up was like a like a like a mix or something which was more a it could have been white noise you know it was just it was just a way of letting people know with headphones on please don't talk to me you know and it was more that really sometimes I wouldn't even have music playing it was just so people wouldn't talk to you you know so you could concentrate on what you were doing uh, just a quick one from me um just a thought I had about you know the whole doping thing um so in 2007 one of your teammates yeah. or any was you know marched out um for being t tested positive for, for doping drugs. And then you yourself expressed in interviews at the time um, a lot of what seems to be quite clearly genuine sort of disapproval and revulsion yeah. of this whole practice. And obviously, um, you know, in the past few years, people have come out from your past teams, like your past doctor, uh, you know, implying that you had done the same stuff. And I find who, that who, hard. Who's that though? Like, they're um, not implied. Or, or said that it's like highly suspect. No, I don't see. I don't. I don't think that ever did. Unless I mean, I don't know if you could produce who it was, but yeah. Um, no, there was one or two disgruntled people that that have kind of thrown accusations like that. But there's no facts or evidence. And this is this is the problem with this subject. Really, is it, it gets such the loss of perspective and the, the, the you know newspapers and how sensationalised it. But when you come back to actual facts and who's you know these things here, there's very little substance in all this thing. And it's a lot of bad blood in a lot of cases. And this is where cycling doesn't do itself any favours, really. Um, but it's, um, no, I mean, I, I, I would challenge anyone to come and show me any facts and things like that and, and talk about this subject, really, but, you know, disgruntled doctors or, you know, assumptions and things like that, particularly when I said one of them's a, a, a Times journalist, um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's it, honestly, I've, I've seen a lot over the last couple of years since all this subject's been going on, around, and it's not over yet, by the way, this whole one that's been for me, and it will come out who it actually was. Yeah. And I tell you what, I'm going to make millions out of it in sort of reward and that for it because it's um, it will shock a lot of people and it's it's gonna it's it's bigger than the sport and it's bigger it's bigger than just this package and stuff like this. This mm. is this is this is public money corruption and all sorts that's been going on. It's why pub, House of, uh, House of Common parliamentary hearing thing was launched and all this about it. It's massive and um, it's not over yet. And UCAD have just struck off Dr. Richard Freeman for um, you know. Um, you know, failing keeping records and things like this and ordering testosterone patches and that for a rider. Um, and, and I was an easy sort of, you know, scapegoat for all that uh, uh, headline. But I was actually ever accused of anything. But um, it's not over yet and it will come out who they were actually for soon because um, in order, you know, the GMC have struck off the doctor, now Richard, which means UCAP can now relaunch the investigation and patient confidentiality has now gone away because he doesn't have to keep patient confidentiality anymore because he's just struck off. And so UCAP can now go and look and redo the tests and see who this, these patches and all that were for now. So it'd be quite interesting. I can't wait for it to come out. I kind of got an idea who it was. I'm not saying here, because it'd be in a Daily Mail tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and then in your 2018 interview with the BBC, you said you'd like to, if you could do one thing, it would be to dispel these sort of rumours and accusations about your I don't have legacy. to dispel it. I mean, you can't you dispel it. I with facts, that? really. And, and this, yeah. this, what, what will come next is... We'll do that. So you're confident about that? Oh, well, fucking, you know. Good. Yeah, it's not about confidence, it's about what you know has happened. Yeah. 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 Was there, like, a lot of other people on the, in the teams doing that kind of stuff? No. Not, not that I'm aware yeah, of, no. Yeah. This is what's become so murky about the whole yeah. thing. It's become sort of so grossly sensationalised and, and linked with the Lance Armstrong era and all this. But yeah. the reality is that the fact it's gone on this long was because nothing happened, you know, and I think it's just, it was um, a witch hunt in some cases from certain certain people. This was two big rival newspapers going head to head. They've got the Murdoch empire behind the Team Sky. There's a lot, became quite political, and it's a lot of it's, it's bigger than the sport, and it's a lot of it's to do with money, and which will also come out. Do you think, like, it's very much a case of when someone says something, then that sticks? Well, of course, yeah, yeah but that's, that's the way the world works, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's, yeah. Well, to leave that behind, um, that would be a. Do you, do you feel, firstly, that this has kind of dragged on the role, of, well, part that cycling has to play in your cycling career in your life when you perhaps want to leave it behind? I don't want to leave it behind. I'm happy to address it. It's just, um, 
you know, you can only... The, the powers that be can only address it, and, yeah. and you have to go through due process, and that's what's been happening and still not finished yet. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not the case of leaving it behind, you know. You, you, but these things will come, you know, it, through due process, they will, you know, we'll find... It will come to the... Um, the end result with it, really. It's not something I want to leave behind, certainly yeah. not, no. And I, I've, you know, lots been going on behind the scenes for, for that not to happen, so it's... Um, but at the same time, you have to be careful what you say in that because um, you, you, there's still investigation going on, yeah. which you don't want to affect. And could you talk um, maybe about what you'd like to do in the next few years, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I don't know. At the moment, I'm kind of in... I'm enjoying seeing what comes next, really. Yeah, yeah. And I've kind of... Explored a few avenues, um, but I want to. Uh, something will come along when I least expect it, I guess, that will catch my interest really. But yeah, so I'm open to anything at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Are you still doing your social care work? No, not really, although I'm still very interested in the subject um, and doing a few things this year, documentary wise, on, on that topic. Mm. Um, but yeah, like I've, I've toyed with a few things over the years really, and I've never really found the thing that. Replace cycling, I suppose. You think you'll ever find that? Probably not. If we have any um, more questions from the floor, we can take a few before we end. Yep, over there. Uh, in the context of your acknowledged encyclopedic knowledge of heroes of the past, uh, how do you bring the current generation of stars? The Gatcher, the mm. Pickard, uh, yeah. uh, Because they seem to me to raise the flair. Yeah, I mean, they. Van Art, Pidcock. Pogaccio, that they will be probably the greatest cyclists by the end of their careers, really. Um, they're, they're phenomenal. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have struggled beating them when I was racing. I think a lot of us would have done. Um, Pogaccio in particular, really, and Vingegaard, I mean, you know, in 20 years' time, we could look back at them as the real kind of best ever that have you know, graced the sport, really. And it, I think we're blessed at the moment with such a good crop. Yeah. Yeah, at the back. Um, where would you say you came in the 2009 tour? Uh, fourth. Well, third, I think it is on Wikipedia now, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, when you started out in school with a child, did you feel the effects of the, the, one of the barriers entry into the school is the fact that you need to be able to put something down on that bike and it was not just sponsored? Yeah, I mean, that's even worse than it ever was now in terms of, you know, costing out certain people in taking up the sport. When I started cycling, it was beg, steal or borrow, really, um, because it wasn't as as expensive a sport as it is now. Um, but now it's through the roof. I can't even afford a bike at the moment. Um, it's uh, I wouldn't want to pay the money that, that they, they ask for them now. It's just um, it's crazy, really. But, like, when I started, I... Um, I had a bike from Halfords for 200 quid or something. And, you know, it's a shame kids now, when I go to kids' races and see you know, um, youth racing and now, the, the, the setups they have is, is, is ridiculous, really. And, and it's, it's, it's an expensive sport for, to get into now for parents. Does it pay, like, at the top end, like, how much? I mean, <laughs> it, I mean if you wanted money, why, why wouldn't you just go into football or something like that? Yeah, I suppose so. It's good. That's a good... Yeah. It's a good uh, suggestion. Well, you can tell your son. <laughs> it's too late for that. Yeah. No. Um, over here. Absolutely unbelievable. Even you find facial hair for the most of the country. I remember watching the tour in the early 90s and just thinking, will we ever get a British swimmer? Mm. And you came along and did that. And I just wanted to say in this room, is your house decorated with all the medals and no. paraphernalia? Or what happened? Uh, no, no, two of them did. I smashed two of them up. Um, the sports personality trophy in my knighthood. Um, but just, just, so I was trying to show my kids that there are just material items. They're not, um, you still have that title and you still have that accolade. Um, but they were the ones that came with it. So they weren't the, um, the disrespect to the medals, if you like, and throwing them on the floor. But they, uh, they are, it, it, it was my sort of stupid way maybe of trying to show with my kids that, um, it's about the application to something and applying yourself to a process over an extended period of time that you get the reward out of it for that hard work, not the material item you get given on the podium. Um, 
And so that was... Um, but I was, I was going through a rough patch. That was about four years ago, and um, the sports personality and things. That was at a time when I wished it hadn't all happened, you know. And kind of took it out on them trophies as well. But, um, yeah. And it's not why you do the sport. That was not why I did the, su- the sport for that success, was to get to win sports personality of the year or get a knighthood, you know. It was, it was, so they were, I was very particular in the ones I chose to smash. Do you think, like, you're an exception for that reason, or this with a lot of other people? I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, over there, back. Um, I was just wondering what you say your kind of favourite climb in the world is. Um, you know, I don't want to say that they're fun anyway, because climbing is not fun, it's oh. just really. Uh, but kind of one of the stopping and being the greatest year would be the most fulfilling if we don't have I mean, Mont Ventoux 2 is quite special. That really is. I wouldn't get up it now. It was, uh, it's brutal, and it's, but it's, it's, it's this incredible landscape at the top. Um, and it, of course, it's synonymous with Tommy Simpson's death and things like that. And um, you know, you can't help but think about that when you're riding up there. But it's, uh, it really is. It's nothing like it. There's no other climb like it for me. Mm. Yeah, at the back there. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think you're encouraged to be and you're enabled to be as well by the people around you, particularly when you get to the high end of the sport. So it's funny, really, and I think, you know, you almost... Yeah, maybe you might not be like that naturally. It might not come easy to you, but certainly by the time of the time, Team Sky years, you know, when you say about what was... What was different in 2011-12 was I was by one of my coaches who said you have to stop putting your family second you know um, and you know you're, you're encouraged to be selfish you're encouraged to be every, you know, the world centres around you you know you sit down there I'll pick your bags up you know you go and you stay you know it just, just everything really you know you kind of everything's done for you smoke's blown up your ass daily you know you can do no wrong and um, over a long period of time you know you, you kind of you think that that's the norm and everyone has to centre around, particularly your own family. Um, you know, and I think it's, um, it's you know, if you're, if you're on a bus, you know, you make an old woman stand up and you sit down because you've got your cyclist, <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like that, really. And I think that's, um, you, you know, lots of people that have, have had long careers and, you know, that, I'm talking about the Tour de France years anyway, this one here, because you have to live like a monk and it becomes sort of a 24-7 religion type thing um, and you become a dreadful person well I did anyway um, but it, you know when you retire as a sportsman lots of sportsmen kind of still hide under that veil of being that that personality and they have an entitlement with it you know that they can get into restaurants for nothing and you know why don't you know do you know who I am and that kind of attitude really and I think that's kind of you know I mean look at Floyd Mayweather you know kind of people like that they just um, they never let it go um, and it's, it's, they, they live under the veil of this, this sportsman they were for the first 36 years of their life, you know, and they've got another 40 to go, and it's, I think it's quite tragic, really, when you see those sort of people clinging on to that past life, and particularly, you know, when, you, when I was in broadcasting and that, in cycling, lots of people I worked with, you know, it's all about, well, when I was a rider, you know, and it's, it's always a reference back to, to when they were cycling or whatever, and um, it's so unhealthy, it really is. Is it still the period, though, that you're most proud of? What would you say you're most proud of? Yeah, no, I am. Yeah, I mean, I am. Yeah, um, you know, the ability to apply yourself and, and, and have the repeat, repeated success and um, the application to certain goals and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and still be an element of yourself through it, even though people don't know that you're a bit of a behind the scenes. You know. Well, thank you very much for your. No, thank you very much. Thank you for all coming. It's been a very. Mate. And it's your, thank you. It's your, uh, it's his last one as well today, so well done. Thank well you done, very Dave. Much. Thank you. <laughs> right, we out of here. Thank you. Right, I'm off. See you later. <laughs>